Hi, Charlie Sykes here. There's really never been a better time to help support the mission of The Bulwark to bring sanity and a non-tribal lens to our national politics. Now, we're not shy about defending democracy and calling out bad actors, and we're building a community for people who value good faith debate and are not necessarily looking for a safe space. So for a short time, we have a special offer for you. Upgrade today to a Bulwark Plus membership and get the next two weeks on us for free. You can cancel any time. That'll give you access to all of our newsletters, including my morning shots and JVL's Triad, as well as all of our other podcasts, including Sarah Longwell's Focus Group, Mona Charon's Beg to Differ, and The Next Level. If you haven't joined us yet, I hope you'll consider it. Thanks. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is Friday. I have to say that I am kind of appalled and amazed that we've come to the end of September already. Uh, so uh, Tim Miller joined me on, on the podcast, the, the weekend podcast. I mean, it, this is it. It's September. And here in Wisconsin, it's like I left for a weekend and I come back and it's fall. And it's so anyway, mm. happy, happy October almost. Mm. I don't miss living in places like that here in California. We're we're right in the prime of of our late summer. Uh, you know, October is our warmest month here, and uh, and uh, so to sit outside. I was getting a tan yesterday. Really? Uh, so I sat outside. Yeah, I was sitting outside on the deck. Uh, I was doing some reading, you know, doing a little prep, draw, working on an article, and uh, just right out there on my deck. It was nice. It's not fall. No sweaters, and uh, and uh, it's really it's it's a nice feeling. I always had a fall depression. I think that was kind of a mentally vestigial uh, related to being in school. That this this continued into my into my thirties. Like you know, the, around the time of going back to school, I'd get depressed. Some people loved going back to school, not me. I loved summer, yeah. And so I, I continue to have that. And I don't get it as bad now. I think because mm-hmm. I don't have to deal with this. So I'm very excited. Oh, we also have one more. Can I promote one thing, Charlie? Sure, before we get please. going, now yes. that we're just you know, mm-hmm. um, we we've brought. If you need a double dose of Tim. I'm still going to be here every Friday. We're just going to still be doing our kind of, you know, grumpy old man, grumpy young man, bestie routine every Friday. But we've brought the next level out from behind the paywall. And and so, and that airs on Wednesdays. So, you know, if people just need a little extra dose, uh, they're getting five days of Charlie already. If they need two days of Tim, something That's to think right. about. Go subscribe. Go subscribe and click on the little deal. It's on YouTube and on Apple Podcasts. This is what America needed. It needed another podcast with Tim I Miller. So. It, it really did. So. so, okay, I want to go back to the the, the, the fall thing because I, I always, I'm, I was not a fan of going back to school either, to, to be honest. Okay. But there's some memory that I'm having here, and I'm, I was actually struggling with it this morning, you know, on, on, on a cool, crisp fall day. And it is actually kind of beautiful here. I mean, the leaves haven't quite changed, but it's, it, it is going to be quite lovely. And I had this moment of sort of trying to remember, you know, sort of a little bit of burst of like happiness and optimism, which is very sort of un, untoward. And I was trying to think, what, what was it that I was, what was remembering? And I'm not sure, you know, maybe that, that sort of sense, you know, that something new was starting, something cool was ahead. You know, I was indulging some sort of, you know, irrational expectation as a, as a young person. And I, you know, and, and, and even though, you know, all of them were doomed to disappointment, um, I, I can still remember those little bursts of optimism. So I'm going to kind of hold on to that so that that is possible. Well, anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that things are going well out there on the left. That is coast, weird. That is nice. I'm glad that you have hopefulness. But I just I just have to say a, mem- one more a, mem- thing. a memory of hopefulness. memory of hopefulness. Well, I just want to just strip it away because one more thing, because not only do I disagree with that, it's like pumpkin spice, the, the sweaters, yep. all of it. Dislike Good. it all. It's the b- bottom of my season list. Well, so, because you, know, you I want to take the fall hate from people. I just, I just, I don't want to be wishy washy on this. It is the I, worst I, for me. And living in California with no fall is is lovely. I understand that you've chosen to have the front road seat to American carnage and the decline and fall of Western <laughs> civilization. You know, earthquakes, wildfires, homelessness, crime. Needles dropping from the sky. By the way, speaking of um, speaking of the decline and fall of Western civilization, I just I just I just wanted to play this just to start off as, as an indication of of the uh, of the decadence of of the West. No, it's beautiful.
Wow, I've never heard a flute degraded like that. No, exactly. For for normal, rational human beings, you're going, wait, wait, Charlie, that that's beautiful. That that was absolutely lovely. And yet I regret to tell you that uh, if if you hang around in the right wing media circles uh, these days, this has become topic number one for um, the degradation of of American culture. And I I, 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 like I kid you not. shit on the Mona Lisa, that little clip that you just played. I hope you understand the degree. We're going to come back to this, okay? okay. I, I, I want to come back because I do, I completely agree with you that that we need to we need to expose our audience to the deep <laughs> thoughts of the of the of the deeply thoughtful uh, Ben Shapiro who devotes a truly extraordinary monologue to how awful it was. Uh, can we play the flute what, what again? What you can, we play the, can we play the flute again? <laughs> it's a gangster rap. I'm outraged. <laughs> Sorry. I, I am appalled. <laughs> I, m- I must say it. It must be. Uh, you know, we have our down moments and everything. Um, but it must really be exhausting <laughs> to be a right wing troll these days. Figuring, okay, what what are you going to do today, honey? Well, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to spend my entire monologue talking about Lizzo playing James Madison's flute. Is really emblematic of everything that's wrong. No, I mean, it's emblematic of everything that's wrong with with American culture. Okay, so no, I'm already gotten to the point where I'm I'm making fun. Can we just let's? I'm going to set this aside. Well, let's work up to this, okay? All right. Because we need some caffeine between ourselves and, and and this discussion. So it's Friday morning. Hurricane Ian has just devastated Florida. These pictures are just absolutely stunning. Uh, the The damage is just horrific. The human suffering almost beyond imagination. And I have to say, and I'm this is something I, I'm sort of withholding and put an asterisk behind. I'm struck by a couple of things that we ought to at least acknowledge. No, number one, you notice that nobody in the White House is talking about uh, punishing Florida because mm. of its politics. There's no movement. There doesn't seem to be any you know, residual opposition to providing federal aid to Florida. And there seems to be a minimal amount of assholery going on between the Democratic president of the United States and the Republican governor of Florida, at least so far. And I think, you know, th- that's the way it should be. But in 2022, because the bar is so low, we had to at least acknowledge that. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, I, I Are think we're going to regret gonna saying a, this. I mean, no, I don't think so. I think it's yeah. going to be a long recovery, and uh, I, I think that this is when people are always like, "Well, you know, what about is it, is what's coming behind Trump worse than Trump, and is it different?" And you can analyze all this. There are like certain elements of this that are unique to his psychopathy, and and like this need to be loved, this desire that I was only going to help people who are going through a national disaster if the governor of that state rubbed my belly. Uh, I, I, that is pretty unique to him. Um, I'm sure there will be other man-children that will come behind, but uh, it will be hard for them to match uh, the extent of his derangement on this particular score. But yeah, you could tell from some of the the conservative media, the anti-anti crowd, um, you know, there was like two hours, two days ago or whenever this was uh, bearing down where, where Biden hadn't yet talked to DeSantis. He talked to like some of the mayors and they're like, oh, you could see how much they were hoping for Biden to have the same level of pettiness, right? Uh, you know, they're always, Biden hasn't talked to him yet. Uh-oh, what? I thought he was going to be mister. And and I guess I saw a report this morning. They've already talked four or five times and, and, he, and he's, you know, acting like a normal president as he has continued to do, which is exactly right and i think this is obvious we shouldn't have to say this like the downside of the performative trollery politics which is that when you're in charge of a state like ron DeSantis is you don't know what crisis is going to hit tomorrow you don't know who you're going to need help from you don't know you're going to have responsibility over people that didn't vote for you i know this was like the baseline of our politics for you know my entire childhood and yours right that that you're governing for everybody even if you're campaigning against people and you need to keep that in mind throughout the process so uh, this is unfor- I, I, you know you don't want something like this to be a reminder because because the it seems really horrible and, and obviously we're sending our thoughts out to the folks in Florida and JVL put put some links up in the triad as well for how we how you mm-hmm. know our community can support that but um, it, it is just this kind of stark reminder right that like there's a there is a reason not just being self-righteous getting on your high horse that politicians aren't supposed to do performative assholery 
you know, for trolling purposes, right? Like, the, the, which is that they have responsibilities over people that might, may or may not have, have ended up voting for them. Yeah, there are real people and you have a real job. All right, the other big story of the morning is that uh, Vladimir Putin had, had held a, a big uh, media event, a big ceremony in which to formally annex Ukrainian territories to Russia after these completely bogus sham elections. You're not my party is devoted to uh, Vladimir Putin and, you know, what, what he's going to do next. And so just give me your, your, your thoughts on all of this, because, I mean, universally, you know, I guess outside of the Tucker Carlson green room, everybody <laughs> is regarding this as pretty much a joke, but perhaps ominous because uh, it, it might mark some kind of an escalation, giving him a pretext to use nuclear weapons. What do you make of all this? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, obviously a uh, Kremlinologist. Uh, mm-hmm. We have Kathy Young, who's been doing great work on this. Fantastic. I've been reading yeah. other other smart people, listening to the Shield of the Republic podcast, mm-hmm. another good mm-hmm. one, to try to get smart. I, and so, I, you know, who knows? I, for me to come up here and say, oh, this is what Putin will do next. I, I think what I tried to get at in, in Not My Party is the state of play um, with, you know, we, we don't need to start patting each other on the back and start doing victory dances in the end zone right now, but the state of play is really very bleak for him. And and, and that's legitimate. I, I, had some, I wanted to do this episode because I had some friends who were texting me, some less political friends who were like, you know, is this like Western media propaganda, yeah. brand, you know, that's happening or is this like really true? And it's like, this is true. I, he's cornered. It's not to say that he's, you know, that a coup is coming and our democracy is coming to Russia anytime soon, but, but they are in a really shockingly bad situation what you would almost say is the worst case situation imaginable like when they were marching to kiev right if we went back and to the podcast that we were doing that week and said okay seven months whatever it is eight months you know from here um he'll be doing conscriptions uh there'll be protests there'll be violent outbursts between the military people that are going to bring people into the military uh his propaganda networks will be starting to complain about him. Uh, big social media accounts, you know, because Russia does have the, it's not like China, Russia has TikTok and stuff, but the most famous, like Russia's social media accounts are, are, are they're starting to speak out and be like, mm-hmm. I don't want to get, mm-hmm. I don't want to get brought into the military. Ukraine's now on offense or has been now for a few weeks in the Kharkiv region and others. So he's in a rough spot. Uh, and, and so I think that there's some legitimate fears that, that somebody that's in a rough spot might start to get desperate and do insane things things. Um, and so that's something to be afraid of. But, um, I, you know, on, uh, just from a straight kind of military state of play perspective, it's hard to think about what Ukraine or and, and us and their Western allies could have done to get them in a better position than they are right now, given the terrible hand that they were dealt by the invasion. Well, and and also uh, Putin's decisions are making things worse for him. Uh, this this call up of three hundred thousand reservists appeared uh, has just been a complete uh, shambolic mess. Uh, I think I saw a tweet yesterday from uh, the former ambassador to Russia, McFall, who, who said that more Russian men have now fled the country than have been actually conscripted. And these pictures of the thousands of of Russian men leaving wow. the country, which, by the way, um, Russians are hearing about. I mean, you know, to, to, your, to your point about the fact that there's social media, you know, every city, every every workplace, you know, has a story now. And um, I was just watching one of these uh, clips of one of the Russian television, you know, pro-Putin propagandists who looked like he was having a you know, a moment of, um, of 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 real personal depression about what's going on here. I mean, they're 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 talking about, hey guys, maybe we should start winning. Maybe we should start doing something. This is really bad that so many people are leaving. You people are going to really regret this. You know, and they played a clip of a priest, you know, saying, you know, what will you come back to? How will you live with yourself? So again, the bottom line is that within Russia there is this tremendous upheaval. It's not just protests. It's people who are leaving the country, families that are being ripped apart. And th- they're talking about this on uh, state media, that this is taking place. So it's it's one thing when you can't go get your happy meal at McDonald's because McDonald's is shut down. It's something else when your son, your brother, your father has basically just packed his bag and left the freaking country because they're calling you up to be used as, you know, cannon fodder in this meat grinder to mix metaphors in in southern ukraine so yeah this is this is not looking shocking good. stat that mcfall stat right uh, yeah you know, it again it's hard to get f- the hard numbers you can be certain of but even if that's in the ballpark of true right more fled than have been conscripted that just shows how uh, how that's being received and i think you tie that to another stat that just keeps sticking with me is the uh, the deaths the russian 
military deaths in in Ukraine exceed the American deaths for the entirety of yeah. Iraq and Afghanistan, right? So again, put you together. think about yeah. yeah, put together, and, and and that is tied over a decade plus, and all this has happened in Russia in less than a year. So you know, not everybody's going to know somebody in their family, just like not everybody in America knows somebody that that was lost in those wars. But but still, you know, you start to right. It starts to become much closer, and and obviously that has an impact on people, and that's. That, and I think that their awareness of how dangerous and how deadly it's been and how poorly it's gone is what's driving a lot of these folks to flee. Okay, and I know the last thing on earth that you need, Tim, is uh, more praise from me. Uh, but but you, <laughs> you, hold on, <laughs> I, I, can we do one more Russia thing before you give me a tongue bath? <laughs> okay, play. Okay, because oh, you're because I want to praise you for a second. Uh, no, I, no, I was no, like, no. somebody had to write this. I, I was glad you did it in your newsletter because I was talking internally. The the Nord Stream to mm-hmm. element of this side of oh, things yeah, is just also right. worth talking about. It's just also worth talking about really quick. Yeah. Because it's crazy. It's crazy. And and it's just like, it's the kind of thing that shows the imbalance about what's happening. You know, when people do the both sides, media criticism, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, there is no lefty equivalent to Tucker Carlson. I mean, there's a Twitter feed somewhere. But like, but Tucker has the biggest platform in in America on news. And, and obviously the biggest on the, on the right-wing media site. Charlie Kirk, we oh did last God, week on yeah. T- Journey Point USA. Charlie Kirk has extremely influential group probably the most influential activist de, group de facto rnc now yeah de, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. I, it really is the party and in some ways he's more the head of the party than romney mcdaniel romney romney and so you have tucker and kirk and others but, but these are just two examples my old friend clay travis i saw did this no oh, uh, just just no. spouting off uh, like randomly accusing the u.s um, there's a news item i assume everybody's seen it but the, where the, the, there's up. a leak or a, which we think is a sabotage of the Nord stream 2 pipeline going from denmark into europe and these conservative talking heads, you know, are out there saying, I think Biden did this, right? Like the U.S. is doing this because they want to escalate because they're such warmongers now and they want nuclear war with Russia. And this is just like madness. This is like the moon landing is faked level accusations. It's, it's everyone is now Alex Jones. Everybody yeah. is now Alex Jones. And it's gone. It's not just, you know, on some, you know, community access cable channel. It's, it's now Fox News and it is Charlie Kirk. And they're all like, well, U.S. intelligence agencies have to be considered guilty until proven innocent. And my point was, OK, so this is this is a weird flex for the America first crowd, which has now become blame America first crowd. I mean, this is what conservatives used to routinely accuse the left of doing that you always blamed America. But even this is like this is fringe stuff because around the world, the assumption is if there was sabotage, it's probably the Russians. There's no evidence, no evidence whatsoever that it is the United States. But, you know, so yes, you you have Tucker Carlson spreading this bullshit. You have Charlie Kirk. It does remind us, though, that once you've decided you're going to accept one big lie, I think your brain is then set up to accept any big lie. One, once you have been deranged in some way, then you're willing to, to believe or be willing to say anything. And I think we're in that moment where because this is so crazy. And so the, and the, the sort of the hate America thing from American conservatives is like, well, this is kind of new, right? Could we at least acknowledge this is new? Yeah, From had a good tweet about how he saw that there was like a little bit of a, a just an ember of this in the early aughts. Uh, From was going back and said an article, but he's like, I never would have thought that this would have it, it re- reached this level. And, and here's another difference, you know, which is sure there are always conspiracy minded people. There are always people out there, but it's just it's hard to imagine, you know, if if John McCain were alive or if we had, you know, the pre defenstrated Lindsey Graham, that there would be people out there accusing the U.S. Of, of sabotaging our European allies in order to agitate for nuclear war. And there are prominent people on Fox. You, there would be somebody out there that would be saying, guys, no, right? Like, this is not right. Okay, uh, you know, like, This is not true. I mean, say what you want about going back to the birtherism stuff. There were always at least some people that were saying, the handful that were like, God, no, this is not true. You, you know, we, we know the McCain old story. And that does matter. Right? Like, like, it's not to say that it's good or that it was perfect back then or that there didn't merit criticism, but it matters to have leaders that are that are correcting the record when there are this outrageous 
level of things being said. And I think in the post-Trump era, they've just all been beaten down to such a degree yeah, that it's like, what's the point? Bother. Why engage? Or, right. yeah, why bother? Right? Because there's nobody. And it's kind of crazy. There's nobody, not a single Republican on the Intelligence Committee. Nobody is coming out, is speaking out and defending the Biden administration on this. It's like, it's a blame America first. It's also blame Biden for everything. Just, uh, just by making something up, out of out of whole cloth, I, you know. There, there, there's no evidence for. There's no logic for. And and they, they they're twisting this video. It shows our new social media world. It's like Biden said some video in February where in a press yeah. conference he's like, "If the Russians do this, we'll shut down Nord Stream 2. Uh, you know. But it was more of a it's a negotiation tactic, right? Like trying to convince them not to invade. Uh, you know, he was he was you know was making that statement, and now they're like, okay, because I have this one little eight second piece of video, now I can pump it out there and and. All the people who are Alex Jones, Tucker Carlson brained will look at that and be like, oh, man, good point. It must have been Biden. It's nuts. Well, and it is nuts. But so it, this hits the trifecta. It's anti-American. It's crazy. But it's also profoundly stupid because the, the notion that 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 yes. we would sabotage our allies at this point, that we would create an energy crisis that would weaken European resolve and maybe drive up the price of gas in this country. It's so stupid to think that that's a strategy. And there's part of me in the back of my mind going, and I, and I wonder this sometimes with, with Trump when he embraces QAnon, it's whether there's sort of this little troll thing going on going, how far can I push it? How much can I make people believe? Okay, so I've done this. What if I told people this? Could I get people? It's sort of like, you know, how powerful am I? How stupid are they? What can I get away with? Because otherwise, why would Tucker Carlson, you know, push something that is so anti-American, crazy, and really, really, really stupid? Help me with this. Uh, Yeah, (laughs) partly maybe that, but it's partly that just this, we have to make Biden look as bad as possible and 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 rip away, and this is where Carlson and, and Bannon get together, rip away the trust in all of these institutions, right. right? Like the only way to do that is to just tear away, you know, the idea that, that, uh, that the Republican base could believe that the FBI can act responsibly ever, you know, that the national security agencies could, that the administration could, that there, any, that there is anybody that is out there that is acting responsibly. And, and so any opportunity you have to like advance something that might chip away at that one more time is an opportunity that they take. So I, I think it's as simple as that. And plus he's kind of a Russian asset. So there's that maybe too. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to argue with you about that. So uh, in, in, in passing, you uh, you invoked the name of John McCain, and that was in the news a- again this this week. It's another one of those. It's almost too exhausting to talk about. Do you, you remember that story that uh, um, during the, the Trump presidency, it, it, it's almost too bizarre to even spend time with, but the Trump White House had wanted the USS John McCain to be out of sight during a photo op they had out in the yeah. Pacific. And, and again, part of it is like, okay, that's just, too petty it's too stupid that because you hate john mccain you don't want this u.s naval ship and its crew to be visible and of course the trump white house said this is ridiculous it's not true it's you know completely fake news and now we're finding out because of freedom of information act uh, request that it was absolutely true it's in black and white they really really did that and this is one of those you know just shoot me now i mean how much can we (laughs) <laughs> he didn't want, he hated, he hates John McCain. The level of pettiness is just like, you can't even get your head around Off it. the charts. So my one thought on this is just, I just want to, like, as soon as you look at the story, you're like, this is so crazy, it's so petty, it's so stupid, Trump is such an asshole, and then you kind of move yeah. on. Yeah. But just like, thinking in the context of, of my book and, and like dealing with the mindset of these people, I just, I, I like to sometimes think, you are the military attache you know, to the White House, and you have to sit down at your government computer and send an email to somebody in Japan. It's like the commander in chief is requesting that we move the USS John McCain ship, or at least turn it around so he doesn't have to see his name. <laughs> like, like, how can you type that email and just maintain even a shred of dignity? Uh, you know, the one. Thing I don't know isn't a direct quote from the email, obviously, but the one thing that is a direct quote from the, from these emails that that really stuck out to me is some, one of the recipients in the Navy uh, or uh, in some chain discussing this replied, "This is just sad," you know, and it is. It's sad. it's like it has just to be demoralizing and sad 
Speaking of demoralizing and sad, okay, can I get to the part where I okay, give yeah. you what you don't need, which is more praise? Um, I'm ready for it. Your 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 piece Butter me the, up, get, baby. Get, yeah, well, the the piece in the Bulwark yesterday, um, which was a thorough deconstruction of a spin article in the Washington Post, and you know, I, again, I, you know, send your DMs to to Tim about this, but the Washington Post the other day did this amazingly credulous article about you know Kevin McCarthy you know, real man of political genius. Behind the scenes, he has really been working to get rid of the crazies in the Republican Party. And of mm. course, the, the example was Madison Cawthorn. And, and, and you, you, you wrote a takedown of this piece saying, OK, this whole thing about Kevin McCarthy being the champion for normalcy. Can I just read a couple of paragraphs, my, my two favorite paragraphs? The Post article quotes an unnamed well-wisher who calls McCarthy a political animal who is not to be trifled with, saying of him, no better friend, no worse enemy. Not to be trifled with. I presume this person insisted on anonymity to avoid the public humiliation that would come with such a ludicrous tongue bath. (laughs) But the next paragraph is better. Because that description doesn't fit McCarthy at all, you wrote. Here it comes. I was actually, when I called this up, I started laughing. (laughs) The truth about Kevin McCarthy is that he's a toadying, spineless suck-up. He's a Scar who thinks he's a Simba, a Saul Goodman who thinks he's a Gus Fring, a Gimp who thinks he's a master. Yeah. Okay, for those of you that are missing the popular culture references, (laughs) I can't help you. I mean, it's just, it's it's too, I don't want to explain it. But... So talk to me about this. I mean, obviously, you know, my read, your read on this was this was Kevin McCarthy trying to figure out a way to reassure the donor class that, uh, yeah. okay, just because I'm going to be in a caucus that has uh, people like uh, Matt Gates and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert and Paul Gosar and Louis Comert and you know, how should I go on? It doesn't mean that I have not really um, been a champion for normal Republicans and the Washington Post just swallowed it down. Yeah. And here's what really, I just, so here's what really how do you step back? Cause I've been in the pitch mode in these meetings. I have a pretty good sense for what happened. Like a couple of these things are true, right? Like, I, you know, Kevin McCarthy, it's not like Kevin McCarthy's just sitting around doing nothing. You know, he's got a super PAC with millions, tens and tens of millions of dollars. And so, I, you know, they looked at some of these primaries, engaged in some of them. They got a couple scalps, you know, they got Madison Cawthorn. They did a little bit of gay baiting to do that. Mm-hmm. I felt like I needed to mention that in the Bullock article since the mm-hmm. Washington Post didn't. Like the wink, wink, Madison's a fag uh, campaign that they were running with like pictures of him in a lacy shirt and pictures of him with a boy uh, with his head on his chest and that weird and, video. And that's probably what did him in. Yeah. No, no, seriously. This, this, is, this is, that is probably what, because all the other stuff obviously doesn't move Republican primary voters. So they, they went there. Okay, go yeah, on. Marjorie Taylor Greene's doing just fine, right? So it's not like Madison's crazy messaging was working. So I'm sure that there's, there were some other North Carolina people weren't happy with them. There were some local elements, but it was it was not a small part of the campaign. Let's just be honest about that. So they, so they got that one. And that was, if you want to compliment somebody for their Machiavellian effort and g- gay baiting Madison Cawthorn to get a more normal Republican in there, like, okay, that's one in the checkbox. Like I, all the other examples though, are just these, oh, well, they did these little small ball things to go after, you know, uh, uh, Laura Loomer, who's this racist bigot that was running in Florida, and it's Carl kind of an Palladino, who, you're right, who's this racist bigot that was running in New York. But it wasn't like a for- forthright campaign against Carl Palladino. I mean, Elise Stefanik, his hand-picked conference chair, endorsed him yeah. <laughs> publicly in the last yeah. week, right? So it's Hello. not like Hello. he's he's, ru- he's run, controlling things with an iron fist here. But, you know, if you, you can put together a package, you know, you can put together a little memo or a PowerPoint deck with like, here are four or five things we did to help a more, more team normal person over a more crazy person in the primaries. And, and get that. Like once you step back to 30,000 feet, like, you realize this is ridiculous. And like he's doing this because he has... A, a, a really a tough job that he's not going to be up for, which is he's got to keep these donors, these New York finance donors who don't like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Madison Cawthorn at all happy by convincing them that he's doing something right, that he's trying to manage this, that he's not doing, you know, that he's not, you know, letting the Herschel walkers and stuff through. And so he's using a couple of these examples to rub these rich guys bellies and like make them feel like they, you know, can, can, can pump money into these houses races and feel good about it feel good that it's not going to be you know nazis running the house caucus next year um but but the problem is that 
that he just he doesn't have any control over the part. This is a bottom up problem, right? He can make a right, couple of right. things on the edges, but but he's not willing to actually take on the fight, right? Uh, you know, this is the Madison example. Like Madison is the only person that he actually did a full frontal fight on. All the other examples in this post article are these secretive, furtive ads that they did behind the scenes. Um, Madison is the only person he took on, actually, t- you know, took on, had the courage to stand up to. And it's because Madison is like a 27-year-old joke who c- accused him of going to cocaine orgies, right? I, I, Madison gave him no no option but to stand up to him. But that was it. It's, he isn't standing up to Bobert. He's not standing up to Paul Gosar, to MTG, to Mo Brooks, to uh, the other uh, insurrectionists that were planning the January 6th thing. Uh, there are three people that were at the January 6th and, at and around the Capitol, not just at the Randall that went to the Capitol, three House nominees in, in this caucus. He's not, he support, they, they, he's endorsed all of them. Uh, one of the three they did try to do pr- primary campaigns against. That failed. Obviously, we've discussed v- people that voted to impeach. Kevin didn't defend any of them, really. Peter Meyer. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he didn't. He did nothing for Peter Meyer. All he did was whine about the mean Democrats running ads that, that talked about how John Gibbs was an insurrectionist, and then voters voted for him. Like they mm-hmm. didn't try to campaign for Peter Meyer. Peter Meyer's name isn't mentioned in this Washington Post article. They did try to campaign for Jamie Herrera Butler, who's running against like a literal like dude who plays more than footsie with white nationalists. Um, and, and, and that failed. Right. So just across, and then, and then across the board, they're insane people. I, you know, you can read the article, but I, yeah. my favorite one was in Colorado, you know, my home state, a woman who was the leader of the effort to secede 11 counties is, is the nominee for the new swing district that they just created because of redistricting. Because Colorado normal, is growing. Normal. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Super normal. And so, so I, you know, this, the, the reality of Kevin McCarthy, just, just as to, you know, bring this to the, you know, most discreet point is that he saw the failure of Boehner and Ryan of being able to control the crazies, right? Boehner and Ryan, say what you want about them, at least tried to fight them on certain things, right? Mm -hmm. For Ryan, it was, it was, you know, budget stuff, Boehner was immigration stuff. And they they both got overthrown basically because the the lunatics in their conference didn't didn't want what they were selling. And so McCarthy's insight is: I'm going to give the lunatics everything they want, <laughs> right? right? And then right. I'm going to do a few things behind the scenes to to make the donors happy, right? Like I'm yeah. going to do a few things behind, the, and that's what this article is. This article is: we're not going to have a a insurrection, pun intended, in my conference because I'm going to give the lunatics whatever they want, and and, and you know once a quarter. Maybe not. Actually, you know, twice a year, I'm going to do one thing that's going to make the people that you know live in New York who don't follow this as closely, who are pumping money into my packs, feel like you know that they have got a responsible team, normal hand at the tiller, and and like that, that and that's it. And that is why, like you know, he's the gimp, not the master, because he's not. You're only powerful if you it can actually use your power and influence to to do something right and like that and kevin's proposition is not that he's like i want to be in power but let the mob control me and that way and i will stay in power that way and it, you know it's not nothing he's going to be the speaker of the house he's going to get a little bust in the capitol but it's not it, it's not machiavellian hard heading politicking so what what kind of a reaction did you get to this piece because i i have to say that i was surprised reading it because you, usually the washington post political Coverage is a little more savvy, a little more spin resistant. You get some blowback to this, Tim? Yeah, I did. I well, I I had a very heavy amount of direct messages from political reporters since I don't. Some we of them listen the to this street, podcast. Right? That was, that was yeah, the word, some, yeah, some of them listen to this podcast. So I don't. I don't want to uh, <laughs> betray any private <laughs> messages. Um, hello, Washington political reporters listening to the board mm-hmm. podcast. But there were several who were giving me quiet applause because they were like, what the fuck was that article? Okay, right. um, but, you know, I can't do that because I'm writing for yeah. another outlet. Uh, yeah. There were others who were doing the whole, oh, you're being too mean. Like, uh, you know, it's not nothing that they beat Laura Loomer down in Florida. Like, doesn't he, yes, I, you know, Christ. don't we have to give some credit where due? And I'm just like, I, no, I don't. I don't. I actually, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think that once you've submitted to letting the caucus bully you into trying to end our democracy, I think you got to demonstrate like a little bit more public facing courage than just standing up to Madison Cawthorn if you want to get an attaboy, right? I, I just I, I don't think that the attaboys are are called for here. I think you could write an article mentioning that they did secretly, you know, try to 
nudge a few of these primaries the right direction and they had a deeply mixed record <laughs> in, in, of success in doing that but trying to turn them into a Svengali that's a zero so yeah yeah you know a little a little buzz about about the about that in Washington but this is this is what ha- this is like the in- navel gazy like BS to be honest yeah so uh, one related question you kind of mentioned this you, you wrote in the article as somebody who's made self-aggrandizing pitches about my side's political genius yeah. for political reporters I know how to leverage a Shoot what flies, claim what falls ethos to make yourself look brilliant. What, what is the shoot what flies, claim what falls I love ethos? this. this I love that consult- line. What, what is that? Explain that for me. This was my go-to <laughs> consultant move. So if you're out there and you're a consultant, just put this one in your, this is your new yeah. motto, you know, put it in your hatch. Shoot what flies means, you know, you go out there, you put out press releases, you maybe, it, uh, if it's a positive thing, you know, you try to pitch reporters. You do what you can to draw attention to your um, to your client. And uh, you know, if uh, articles pop up, if people tweet about it, if something goes your way, you take credit. <laughs> it's a it's a hunting thing. It's like you know, if there are a bunch of birds up in the air, I did that. Yeah, that was, just, that was me. Yeah, everybody's <laughs> just shooting at the at the gaggle of geese up in the air, and 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 there's five of you, and everybody's shooting, and one of the geese falls. You 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 get to claim what fell. All right, so. I think that is what's happening here, right? They did some ads in a couple dozen districts, and you know, five of them, the crazy person lost uh, out of four hundred thirty-five. It's a you put together a little package. You 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 claim what yeah. you claim what falls. Those were my five, you know, and I think that's uh, that's what's happening here. Okay, I I do want to get to the decline and fall of Western civilization, a la uh, Ben Shapiro, in a moment. But but since we're on this this issue of spin as as a former recovering spin master uh, communicator. I wanted to get your thoughts on the way the White House handled uh, one of uh, Joe Biden's gaffes yeah. this week, probably the le- bottom story of the week. But but I, I wanted to just get your, your thoughts on it. So so Biden is uh, at this White House uh, conference and, you know, he does his, you know, call out to elected officials and he, and he does and he does a call out to, you know, Congressman Jackie uh, Walorski saying, hey, Jackie, is Jackie in the house? And everybody's going, oh, shit, you know, because Jackie Walorski was killed in a car accident last month. So it's a gap. OK, so it happens. He goes, you know, Jackie, where are you? Where's Jackie? And the audience has got to be going off. OK, so this comes up at the White House briefing. So Corinne Jean-Pierre, who's I think a pretty, pretty smart a lady tries to spin it as saying, well, she was top of uh, the president's mind. Uh, there was no gap there. He was thinking about her, et, et, et cetera. What should she have said? I'm happy I don't have her job. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I'll start there. Uh, that's 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 tough. I, to be honest, I just, I don't understand in these situations, this has been a long time, like little knit of mine. I didn't know you were going to bring this up. So I, mm-hmm. I've, I felt this way going back to, Bush era, and I've always like, I wonder if Jeb ever won, if I could actually do this, or if there's just too much internal pressure in the White House to not do th- this little thing, which is just admit a minor mistake. Yeah, right. right. Obama's spokespeople were reluctant to do this. Obviously, Trump's people never mm-hmm. would. I mean, I t- to the most mm-hmm. absurd ends would not admit anything. But I just I don't know why it's wrong. I mean, there are 435 members of the House, and um, and you know I, I think that uh, you know the right answer is just to say that like uh, that that. President Biden just, you know, was was, you know, had forgotten about the details of Representative Wolarski. Uh, as soon as the uh, event was over, he called her late yeah. husband or brother or whatever um, to issue to, you know, issue his condolences. The press of the United States has to meet thousands of people, right? Like this right. becomes really sensitive here. Like I think it's one of those things where, like, would that be that hard to say if the president was Pete? Right. You know, I mean, like somebody who is obviously extremely sharp and and whatever. And it's just like, you know, the president meets tens of thousands of people and sometimes shit happens. Right. You forget like the details around something. Uh, but, but because the sensitivity around Biden's, you know, age and uh, and the fact that, you know, he's obviously lost a step, um, I, I think makes makes them reluctant drives the reluctance to like give the Republican media ecosystem, uh, you know, a, a win on anything, like give them a little opportunity to like play a quote where, you know, she, they use worse, the word though. forgot. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I, 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 I know, I'm explaining their logic. Okay. He made a mistake. He regrets it. Get a life. I mean, yeah. why, why try to, well, he was thinking about, I mean, it was, felt like it was almost like one step short of when he's going, you know, Jackie, where, you know, are you here? Where's Jackie? You know, they could have asked it. Well, um, the president was praying. 
He's Catholic, um, and he believes that her mortal soul uh, still lives. Right. And so, is this an is this an attack on Christianity? Are you attacking the president's faith? Because I, mean, you know, because it was just so bizarre. It's just okay. He yeah, fucked up. Just, just a, like get over yeah, it. Can we move on? I mean, there's there's a hurricane. There's a war going on. Yeah. There's an economy, and you're asking about. You're asking about a gap. It happens. It's a mistake. Next. And then he called the family and he did. And again, and that's another thing, which is like something Trump wouldn't have done. And other sort of, which is like, you know, he, it's a Republican. He called the family, you know, wished their condolences, sent, sent his regards. It feels deeply sad. Maybe even shout out the other people that died in the car. You know, wanted he wanted me to mention, you know, he asked me when I came out yeah. today to mention, right? Yeah. And there are plenty of things you can do to like show that you care while also just saying like, I screwed up. Yeah, exactly. Not that, that's not the worst thing in the world. Screwed up. On yeah, that. I just, I, I screwed up. It would be kind of refreshing in its own way. Okay, so deep breath. Are we ready for this here? You tweeted out last night. I did a typo. This, Are you going to read the typo? No, no. This yeah, video is, is an astonishing piece of art that we should put in the Library of Congress and let our ancestors review centuries hence that was the title and you, it's descendants and you, well, our descendants view centuries hence okay I, i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah i <laughs> i see see i made a mistake get over it i made just a went, mistake get over it it's descendants i get it thank you david bose i didn't even catch it okay so what you link to is ben shapiro who unfortunately I once told the New York Times was a thinking man's conservative, uh, one of my worst takes ever. <laughs> wait, I was wait, 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 wrong. Sorry. I made a mistake. Uh, that was you? Fuck me. Get over it. I said I, something like- I swear like, to God, how did I not know that was you all these oh, I, years? I, I, no, 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 no. I was one of the people. Somebody else said this. I, oh, I, I You were they, in the They story. quoted me as saying something like, he reads books or something. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, it came off I'm as-, as, the, as I'm finding the quote. Okay, I'm, we'll, we'll review the exact okay, quote. It's a dumb week. quote that sounds as dumb as it was. I, don't know, <laughs> I, I, have, I have no complaints about it. I just just move on. So I made a mistake. I made I a apologize. mistake. I let's I, move forward. <laughs> I I deeply regret it. And on my list of really bad takes, it's on page six, but which is single spaced, by the way. Um, but you you link to this video of and like, so let's let's just play a little bit of this. This is all about Lizzo. I'm so excited for this. Twerking with James Madison's flute the vulgarization of American history. So think about all the things that are going on in the world. And, you know, Ben Shapiro takes a break from, you know, worried about, um, you know, the demasculinization of the U.S. military. So, by the way, if you notice, he's, he's wearing a beard now. It's a very, it's a kind of a puby beard, if I could okay. say that. So this is, this is the video, this astonishing piece of art that should be put in the Library of Congress so that our descendants can review it centuries hence. Um, I, I need to note editorially, though, that this this soundbite is not enhanced. We did not speed it up. This is actually Ben Shapiro's voice. This is the way he talks. This is the actual thing, Ben Shapiro. The reason the clip is viral is the contrast between a person twerking and the idea of a of a an extraordinarily classy instrument, a historic instrument that speaks to sort of the gentility of. America's founders <laughs> being brought into a context that is vulgar. It's the vulgarization of American history. Again, Lizzo did both, and only one of those clips went viral. And so if you notice that, then you're very, very bad. If you notice that, then this means that you're some sort of racist, or it means that you don't want black people playing the flute or something. No, I just don't want people twerking with historic instruments. By the way, I'd be similarly offended as a violinist. If there was a Stradivarius, somebody had a Strad, and that Strad was lent out to a Brad. musician who then proceeded to twerk on the Strad. I would also be insulted because it turns out that great art should not be degraded. Great art, American okay. history, they should not okay. be degraded okay. by judging. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. I, okay. yeah. I would love to see it. twerking great Strad. Art. Hopefully we'll get somebody doing a twerking on a Strad video by next week. That is okay. some good shit, Charlie. Okay, so some of our core audience will put in the comment section, Tim, could you please explain to us what twerking is? <laughs> the, the, what the, could you define twerking so that we can understand the umbrage taken by Ben Shapiro, champion of great art? Twerking is like a gyrating butt dance, you know, kind of like if you're just really, it's, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a dance that's focused really on the gluteus. A lot of okay. gyrating kind of in some, some kind of drop and low. Um, you can Google it. I think it. it's fair uh, to say that, that James Madison never moved his butt when he was playing the flute. 
I, well, a fun fact that I've learned subsequent to Ben Shapiro's video, which I, you only played a third of it. Yeah. I watched the entire could, three could, minutes take three times. I, I, I watched it all three times. I, I, I sat back. I got a I got a glass of wine out before I listened. You to it wanted again. me to play the full three minutes. I, I can't <laughs> do it. <laughs> I was. So I've watched it now. Now I guess three and a half times. Um, and uh, you know, the interesting fun fact. I did a little googling. Is that James Madison's flute? Technically, I guess it was technically James Madison's flute, but then it was his son's flute. The son was an alcoholic and had debts and so- sold the flute to like I don't. They didn't have pawn shops back then, but whatever. The guy at the local corner store or whatever to pay off his or the bar or, to pay off his debts. And so you know, I, just as a matter of facts, like let's putting aside some of the other elements of this. I, you know, I don't know. The, about the gentility with which the flute had been treated uh, in its day in the uh, back in the 18th century, uh, but you know that's just a that's just a point of point of interest. Hey, can you imagine? So, what was this all about? So, how, how, how did Lizzo end up with James Madison's flute, and why should we care? Yeah, what happened was the archives, I guess, tweeted out or posted in some place a picture of a crystal flute that they had. That you know was James Madison's crystal flute. Lizzo, for people who don't know, is a is a flautist uh, and also a pop star. And She's so actually a very, she, very talented flautist, which I did not know. Super okay. talented. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, that was, mm-hmm. I think, her first. Uh, uh, you know what? What she was trained in. Uh, I don't think she was trained in, in twerking. Um, I think she was trained on the flute. And so, um, uh, and I think, and it's very accessible music. Every pop music. If you don't know Lizzo, just go ahead and pull up Spotify. Check yourself out about damn time or something. I think you'll enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And um, and so she, I guess I, I don't know which social media account, but on one of her social accounts said, I think maybe Twitter said, I really want to play that. And so she has a concert coming up in D.C. And so the was it the Archives or Library of Congress? I said Archives, library, but I think it was Library, library of Congress. Of Congress. Yeah. I, meant, I meant Library of Congress. Said, you know, why don't you come by? And so the Library of Congress let her play it two times, once it within the Library of Congress, and then she did, they brought it out on stage at her concert in D.C., at where she played, I guess, two notes, and then kind of talked about how badass it was that she got to play the flute, and then, you know, did some twerking. And this was what, this was what riled up a little bit. Um, I don't know if it got some you know, feelings going down in his private area or what it was uh, exactly that riled him up so much. But that was that part of the video that, that is what he's trying to distinguish. You know, her treating it with respect in the Library of Congress, one thing, playing two notes out on stage, that doing a twerk while it's dressed scantily clad. We didn't make it to the part of the video where he complains about her dress. Too much skin for Ben. I guess he was hoping for the hijab, I guess, on, on Lizzo. I don't know. But um, uh, too much skin for him. Not appropriate. Degrading American history. And, you know, here, here's, I think, the, my most interesting take on this, Charlie, is that I think he really has convinced himself that he's mad. Really? He really? He, that's real? I spent a lot of yeah. time ruminating on this. And I'm like... Is this just one of those things where you need content today and you got to come up with something yeah. and you see a black lady with a historic flute and you're like, I'm going to be mad about this. I'm going to get riled up. The, but what the, I think they're is, letting black women now play James Madison's flute. This flute. is where the country has come. Yeah, exactly. Because black Maybe. women were not allowed to touch that flute back then. Back then, yeah. We should have respect for the historic context which the flute was in, where the black lady would have been a slave. Um, no, I think that what has happened is that your brain gets broken. By being on the internet constantly every day, being for having to be fake mad about things, and eventually the, our brains are are powerful and we can mold them. and And I think that his brain, he's molded it at, to such a degree that that he creates a, a a facsimile of of genuine anger that his brain's stem feeds down to him. Uh, when he sees something like this, because he knows he has to do this. And so he's now convinced himself of these things that this, because when you watch me, he goes on and on. It's just about like the people, about how people who now get mad at me and say I'm a racist for being mad at this. And like, they don't, how, how can they not understand how we might not be outraged by the degradation of this historic flute that I just learned about two minutes ago that I didn't know existed before. And I truly believe that they've convinced himself of this. Yeah, yeah. So the payoff is that somebody will call him racist, which then becomes, see, right. I must be doing something well. Must you know, right? As, right? as Carrie Lake pointed out, you know, that, you know, if you're not being called a racist or a fascist, you're not doing it right. So, I mean, here's the what thing, though, about, about, about daily commentary. And you and I both know this. In, in this environment, choosing what to comment on and what not to comment on is, is triage, right? Because there's just so much. You have to pick yeah. just the biggest things. I mean, 
we've you know we talked about you know the, the hurricane we've talked about russia we've talked about the elections there's just so much and so this is why just take a moment close your eyes and think you're ben shapiro there is this entire universe out there you think that the world is really falling apart there is carnage people are dying and you devote the entire segment to Lizzo playing James Madison's flute, and you're really upset about it. If I got upset over every little thing, I don't think that I would be able to move. You know what I'm saying? It's like it would be big. But he's convinced himself, but they've convinced themselves that this is the the problem, right? Is that the culture has been taken over by black people and women and minorities and the old traditional is that classical what it's about, music. Is, yeah, 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 yeah. That's classical music. There's a race element to it, but there's also a cultural conservative, right? Like we've lost the culture. And like there are these few things left that we're holding on to, like classical music and flutes. Right, like the, the the woke libs have taken over, you yeah. know, popular music and Disney and all these things, and this, and we have this one thing that we're just holding on to so tight, you know, our love of of traditional, you know, the fact that our American fights that were played uh, at the Revolution, and now they're trying to take that from us too. I, yeah. I do. I think that they've convinced. I, I I do. I do. I no, think I, that I, he's convinced I, himself so I, that, that that is something to be upset about. It's 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 insane. It's one of the top podcasts in America. People are listening is. to that and nodding along. Like that's deeply concerning about the state of affairs. But I, I think that that's what's happening. So we run through all the Disney movies to be outraged about. I mean, what whatever happened with that? I mean, I I, I thought they were sort of settling into girl, girl, Buzz like, Lightyear kiss. The girl, girl, uh, Buzz Lightyear right. kiss. That happened. Or the outrage Still about like. what the Little Mermaid, you know, might be black, <laughs> because of course, as we all know, the Little Mermaid is white. How do you get pigmentation under the sea, Charlie? How do you get pigmentation <laughs> under the sea? It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense, okay? It's just woke just, nonsense. I'm, I'm going to it's wake in up. in the song, man. under the sea, what under the do? sea. When you're way down there, how do you get, how would you get a pigment, okay? Like, come on, let's just be, let's just be honest here. I, I, I don't understand why it's, you know, why, why that view isn't just accepted. Okay, it's the libs that have gone it, crazy. It is interesting mentality going out there going, what will upset me today? What can I be outraged about? And what can I get my audience to be outraged about? Oh, wait, the Little Mermaid, uh, the uh, James Madison flute. Okay, speaking of- You should of, just play the strat. I just have one piece of advice to everybody. And this is, I think maybe there are okay. some people who listen to this, which is like, if you find yourself getting mad about something like mm -hmm. this, genuinely upset and stupid, like Ben, I think, needs to go out to the field, find some grass, sit in it, Take the little Stradivarius that he yeah. plays. I guess he likes the viola or whatever. Yeah. And just, you know, play some songs. Play some songs. Put the phone down. Just play some songs. Find just find some himself. find some inner peace. Yoga. You know, whatever it is for you. Go to the beach. Everyone can just take a lesson from, from Ben this weekend. Don't be Ben. Go out there this weekend. Don't, put the don't phone down. Touch some grass. So speaking speaking of American carnage, yeah. I understand you have some thoughts about Jeffrey Dahmer. I do. As I mentioned to you, um, I actually lived being here in Milwaukee, and I was always on the. I mean, I uh, I lived through that on a daily basis. It was all consuming um, here in Milwaukee, and I just I I can't bring myself to even comment on it because I I still I guess I suffer from a little bit of PTSD because I spent so much time on it at the time. Um, got to know one of the cops involved. I can remember almost every single detail of it. So, but now there's a movie because we just need to revisit Jeffrey yeah. Dahmer. I'm not quite sure why, but your thoughts? Yeah, I think the point of why, I guess, uh, I don't, and I don't know if I agree with this, but the the justification, the rationalization the, from the from the artist of this, it's a series, it's a limited series on Netflix. Not a movie. I wish it was a movie because I, I wish I could be done with it. I'm only through two episodes and, I, and I'm so upset and so enraged and I, have, I it cost me sleep last night, which is why I have to, to bring it up before we leave the podcast today. But um, uh, it was that like they were kind of centering the stories of the victims. Which is there's not nothing to that. Like I, I really didn't know who the victims were, and and so it's kind of like, you know, we're going to retell this guy's story, but also like really focus on the people that he ate. Um, which uh, okay, I guess maybe if their families want that, I, I really don't know. Um, you know. It's hard for me to put myself in the mindset of somebody um, whose family member was eaten uh, by Jeffrey Dahmer, but um, I. Uh, I, I I just so I was a child, right? So I have a totally different experience with this than you. Like you lived every minute of it. You're on the radio. I was a mm -hmm. child when this happened, and so for some reason, like in my mind's eye, 
I, I, I'd never gone back and read the Jeffrey Dahmer stories. I knew the basics, but I thought he was like a guy. I thought it was one of these like three per, one percenter guys. It was like living out in rural Wisconsin, like in a, know. you know what I mean? Yeah, like in a in a you know some sort of mm-hmm. log cabin far away from people, and then he'd mm-hmm. kidnap people and bring. Them. I, I don't know why I thought that. Um, but that's what I, you know, it was, again, I, I just, I was a kid when this was on the news. I don't think my parents were like making me follow the details of this moment by moment, probably for, uh, you know, mental health purposes. And so when I'm watching this last night, I got through two episodes and I'm so angry. Like it's, it was, it, it is just, it's reminiscent of all these other things that, that you, I feel like every time I watch one of these limited series or go back and watch a documentary, I'm like, this could have been stopped so much earlier. Yep. It should have been stopped so yep. much earlier. Yep. It is just unbelievable. He's in this tenement. You know, yeah. there there's a woman that is his neighbor that they played the audio of the actual audio in the second episode of yeah. I believe it's his second victim. So it's very early in the process of the of the woman next door calling the police and uh and, and just being like I, 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 th- th- what's happening the kid that is next door is a child like something very weird is happening with this child and, and they're like no they're just gay and they're just lovers or whatever yeah, and she's Connor like no I don't story, think so man. yeah I, I, and <sighs> so I, I just like I'm watching this and it just fills me with with just absolute rage and um and and so I, I don't know how, this is why I wanted to bring it up for you because you you know knew the cops mm-hmm. and all this and, and I you know you don't know how much I haven't gone back and read all the Wikipedias, but it just seems like an utterly unbelievable ball drop. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe like Uvalde level, but like by his dad, who should have known, by the cop, you know, by the people was reported. Like the smell is in this building, but it's in a crack house, so people don't go in there. You know, uh, anyway, I don't know. It, it no. just fills me with rage. And then I was uh, the gay angle maybe makes feel a little more personal, like these poor, like closeted boys that are getting pulled back. To, anyway, it, it just. I, I don't if you're if you haven't watched yet, I just don't know if I can recommend it because my blood pressure was skyrocketing last I, night. I can assure that I will not watch it. Um, but I would strongly recommend and I devoted my newsletter to it today to uh, the, the the Ken Burns series on the US and the Holocaust. Uh, but I will say, without any embarrassment whatsoever, that I find it very, very difficult to watch. And I have turned it off and walked away. Um when you see what we did as a country, um, the brutal indifference to uh, the re- refugees. And I have to say that it, it becomes much, much more powerful than it would have been, say, 10 yeah. years ago to feel all of the echoes and to hear the rhetoric with which, you know, American politicians and, and, and you know, talk radio hosts use to justify uh, not allowing, uh, you know, Jewish uh, asylum seekers into the country to, to hear the echoes of what's going on right now. Um, and Ken Burns, by the way, is, you know, it was very, very clear that he understood what he was doing to, you know, it doesn't have to be explicit about it because we all recognize all the things that are going on, yeah. but the story of, and, and again, you know, this is one thing that, uh, that I, I knew about in, in, in the past, I'm guessing it's new to a lot of people, the story of the St. Louis, the ship of more than 900 uh, Jews who left uh, Hamburg, uh, seeking, you know, to get away from, uh, the Holocaust and, uh, they show up in Cuba, they show up in the United States, and uh, they were turned away and they were sent back. They pleaded. Um, we knew. I mean, you know, we knew uh, the New York Times, you know, called it the saddest ship uh, afloat. Uh, and yet we we sent them back and uh, hundreds of them were killed by by the Nazis. And this was something that it wasn't that we were ignorant of it is that, that America decided that we were not going to take refugees. We were not going to treat asylum uh, seekers with humanity. And it just feels so relevant at the moment. Oh my gosh! I know. I was reading your thing, and yeah. it's it's so painful. And I was reading yesterday. I know we're going long, uh, long yeah. show here. But um, in the triad yesterday, which is the afternoon newsletter yeah. for Bullard Post, uh, JVL linked to this story. This is in I think New York Magazine. Painful. The story of an anonymous one of the of Venezuelans that came, and you just read the story, and this person walked from Venezuela, essentially, mm-hmm. right? And, or thumbed it, you know, got in some uh, cars. But I, a, a big portion of the trip from Venezuela was on foot. Gets to the border, come, you know, is fleeing communism, comes across, is, is, is like uh, being fed meals to, to survive for a few days while he awaits, you know, obviously we have this backlog um, of, of uh, court dates. He gets a court date in Philadelphia. How's he supposed to get there? He's across the border. Uh, and then and then he gets tricked by, you know, Ron DeSantis' uh, goons uh, and sent to on the Martha's Vineyards thing. But you're, I'm just, I was just watching this and just thinking of just how horrible this 
of the echoes of the St. Louis incident you're talking about, but also of just how intractable this problem is, right? Which is just like, how could we, even if we wanted to, lessen this like desire of people to come here if someone is going to walk from Venezuela, you know, because he feared death, couldn't feed family, living in communism. You know, obviously there are things that we have to do to to manage what's happening on the border. But um, but you just read that story and think, I, like, we don't have any choice but to try to figure out. I, at least I feel like we don't have any choice but to try to figure out how to how to manage this in a way that like gives some of these people a chance. But anyway, you know, I, I didn't include it in in my article, which you can read again. Uh, Reliving a sorted chapter in American history. If if you if you're a subscriber, you got it in your mailbox. If you're a reader of the Bulwark, it's still below the fold here. Um, but you know, talking about the how we had closed the doors to all of the asylum seekers and turned away, you know, the hundreds of uh, of refugees on on the St. Louis. As horrible as that was. What I didn't include, in, well, at least we didn't have uh, isolationist politicians uh, turning those uh, asylum seekers into a joke. They didn't right. use them. They didn't lie to them. They didn't uh, use them for well, you know, what would have been a 1939 photo op. Um, they didn't treat them as some sort of a pawn in a political game. You know, as bad as and as sordid and appalling as what happened in the 1930s and 1940s was, Compare it to what we're doing right now and the fact that, you know, that, you know, there's there's so there's so much glee at look, we've taken these asylum seekers and we've, you know, lied to them about, you know, where they're going to go. And we put them on a plane and we <laughs> drop them off in Martha's Vineyard. Sure. It, you know, imagine in 1939, you know, taking Jewish refugees from Hitler's Germany and treating them that way. So, I mean, it was awful. It is one of the worst stains on American history back then. And yet, compared to where we're at right now, and we're not in a position to say, boy, what was wrong with those people? We are not, Charlie. We are not. We are not. Tim Miller, thank you for going along. I appreciate it very, very much. You have a great weekend. Hey, everybody. You all have a great weekend, too. See you next week, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast. And we'll be back tomorrow. We'll do this all over again. <laughs>